What's up YouTube and welcome to the next episode of my PS1 Publisher Spotlight series. Today we're going to take a look at quite a huge library of games published by Capcom in the United States. Capcom was obviously one of the big powerhouse publishers of the PS1 library. Uh, some for good, some for bad. <laughs> a few of their games were, uh, well, many of their games were arcade translations. Some of them did very well uh, with that translation to the PS1, some not so much, but either way, there are some very uh, noted series that you're going to see in this video. Some that started on the PS1 and then some that were obviously a continuation from prior platforms. So I won't be able to linger real long on these games just because I have 42 unique titles to show you plus some variants in this video. But I do think I can touch on everything that Capcom put out in the United States for the PS1 in this video. Um, with that, you're going to see several variants, including some of the Fighter's Edge variants, which I've already done a separate video on, so if you're just curious about those, um, I also have covered that set in depth as well. So let's go ahead and get started, and uh, I'll try to work through these as quickly as I can and really give you a, a glimpse into all the variety of games that Capcom put out for the system. So we're going to start off with something that Capcom is not really known for, but they did actually put out a couple of RPGs on the system. And the first one of these is Breath of Fire 3. So we're just going to go in alphabetical order through this whole set. Uh, Breath of Fire 3, kind of a second tier RPG, I think, you know, for, for most fans, there's really nobody that would consider this their all-time favorite, especially considering all the PS1 RPGs that are out there. Um, I think this one got let down a little bit too by the cover art being a little bland. But uh, overall, a nice looking 2D, you know, hand drawn style RPG. Um, I played this a little bit when it came out. I bought this used, I remember, back in the day, and so I haven't put a ton of time into it. But there was just so many RPGs on the PS1 vying for my attention that this one didn't really capture it as, uh, as much as some of the other ones did. Um, that got followed a couple years later by Breath of Fire 4. This one has much better artwork. And unfortunately, I put even less time into this one. <laughs> but uh, again, I don't think anyone is really clamoring that this is the, the best RPG on the system by any means, but definitely a quality title. And, uh, you know, showed Capcom had a variety of different genres that they could represent. They did make some other RPG series in Japan that we never got, um, such as the El Dorado Gate that uh, came out on the Dreamcast, that series. But, um, you know, overall, this was not really their forte was RPGs. So we just got a couple on the PS1. Another thing Capcom's kind of known for now, especially that they've put out so many arcade-related uh, versions of games on their systems, is that they've done a lot of arcade compilations. But during this era, they really didn't do a ton of those. There's a few we're going to see in this video, but nowhere near the amount that they've put out in the years following. Um, this is one of my favorites, though. This is the Buster Brothers Collection, or the Pang Collection, or the Pong Collection, depending on how you pronounce it. Um, that's the Japanese arcade title, of course. And this has uh, three separate arcade games that are in this compilation. You get the original Buster Brothers, uh, Super Buster Brothers, and then the kind of more obtuse Buster Buddies uh, that probably isn't as well known in the, in the arcade. Um, I really like these games. These were developed by Mitchell, which is a... Uh, great developer that probably is worthy of its own video, uh, but Capcom had a good relationship with Mitchell and it made it really easy for them to put this compilation out. Um, this one's pretty easy to get in the U.S., but for some reason the Japanese version of this collection is very expensive, so um, it's actually one of those weird cases where the U.S. version is easier to find and less expensive than the Japanese release. But uh, if you like quick arcade um, action puzzle type games, I can highly recommend this, and I think it's really cool that they did put this out in the U.S. Uh, next, we're going to get into a fighting game, and this is what you're going to see a ton of in this video because ultimately that's what Capcom was probably known for best, especially during this era, is the 2D fighting games that they put out, as well as some 3D fighters you're going to see. Um, this one came out very late overall compared to most of the other fighters in this video. This is Capcom vs. SNK Pro. Um, it's kind of a watered-down version of Capcom vs. SNK that came out on the Dreamcast. Obviously, that was the system it was probably best made for for the arcade version uh, coming home. But overall, this one, um, you can tell they learned from some of the issues they had with some of the other 2D fighters you're going to see in this, in, this, uh, in this video. And this one overall performs okay um, for its era. Um, I just think that most people had moved beyond the PS1 by the time this one came out. So it's a little bit difficult to find. Um, this one is not part of the Fighter's Edge series, even though it came out like right after all those releases um, were, were run through that series. So I guess they uh, finally decided to end that series before this one came out. Uh, so that's one of the last fighters, if not the last fighter for the system. This is actually one of the earliest ones. This is Darkstalkers the Night Warriors. Um, a great series that, uh, you know, got its home version start on the PS1. 
Um, strangely, we did not get this one in the US on the Saturn, but we got the sequel to this on the Saturn, and then it didn't come out on the PS1. So it's a very, very convoluted home journey <laughs> in the US, whereas Japan got um, all of them for both systems, essentially. But um, really cool game, introduced you to a lot of the classic characters that are still, you know, part of the Dark Darkstalker series all the way through. And um, really like the long box artwork on it. I think it actually looks pretty cool, uh, the long box. It is one of the ridge box cases, which is my least favorite style of case. Um, but ultimately pretty cool to have this in, uh, in good shape. Um, a few years later, they uh, obviously again went down the road of all those Fighter's Edge series games, which was a subset of just fighting games that they were known for. They came in this uh, unique style packaging with like this newsprint looking stuff in the background. Um, for games like this that were a reissue of the long box or a reissue of a prior print, they kind of shrunk down some of the original artwork to fit into a jewel case format or into uh, just a smaller format to get the Fighter's Edge branding on there. Um, the other thing that was kind of unique about these is you got Fighter's Edge points that were part of the uh, the manual here, and you could exchange those in for um, all kinds of Fighter's Edge branded, you know, merch and stuff like that. Um, or you could even trade it in for other games, which is something I did with one of the games you're going to see in this video. But this is one of the variants. Um, this is one of the more difficult ones to find because the original Dark Stalker, Dark Stalkers was several years old by the time this variant came out. So this is really just a, you know, a way to reissue it at a lower price get a whole new generation to play the original game, but ultimately it wasn't meant as like a, a new release by the time this one came out. Uh, next is Darkstalkers 3. So like I said, the second one we did not get in the US on the PS1, but we did get it on Saturn. And this one is also kind of unique because it is part of the Fighter's Edge series, but there is no non-Fighter's Edge variant. This is the only way to get this game on the uh, US PS1. Um, this one was released as a full full dollar title, you know, so this one has more cap or, uh, Fighter's Edge points included in it. Um, this one actually does pretty well performance-wise. It just can't really hold up to the Saturn version, which was Japanese exclusive and uh, is known to be one of the, the top uh, fighting games on that system because it supports the extra RAM cart that the Saturn had. So overall, you can't go wrong, though. It plays very nice. Um, I've put a lot of time into this one on the PS1, and I think it's a fun game. So then we'll get into another one of Capcom's uh, noted genres, especially after the PS1 got its start, and that is survival horror. Uh, this is their uh, the beginning of the unique series Dino Crisis, was this title here. This is the uh, original pressing of the game that came with a bonus disc for Resident Evil 3 Nemesis. You can also get a variant of this that doesn't have that blip on the front, and it only has a single disc. Um, this one comes in this you know single size case that has a little fold out here, and then the demo disc is in the back. Um, but like I said, they do have another version of this that doesn't have the demo disc, or you might just find that a lot of the ones on the market are missing the demo disc, which seems to be the case. But anyways, uh, this series got its start here. I like it okay. Um, I'm not super hooked on Dino Crisis or early survival horror in general, but uh, I did play this one quite a bit when it first came out, and I thought it was pretty fun. So if you like uh, survival horror with some dinosaur action, can't go wrong with this one. And then that was followed up um, a couple years later, I think, by Dino Crisis 2. Um, this one just really doesn't sell nearly as well. I mean, it seems like a lot of people owned the original Dino Crisis, but I think by the time this one came out, PS1 was getting a little bit long in the tooth, and so uh, game sales had dropped by this point, and I don't think as many people bought this game. But uh, overall, I think this one has a pretty good reputation, and uh, if you like the first game or you like the series in general, can't really go wrong with uh, Dino Crisis 2. And then we get into a very weird one. <laughs> this one really stands alone as far as the PS1 Capcom library. Um, this is an early release. It came out just after the long box titles had sunset, uh, but it does come in this thick case. It's a three disc game and it is an FMV spy thriller game called Fox Hunt. Uh, very, very strange game. It is, uh, like I say, very FMV driven as far as the gameplay. So there's just a ton of video in this. The main character that uh, your protagonist is this like cheesy hack Jim Carrey <laughs> wannabe, I guess would be the best way to put it. Um, very over the top with his uh, facial expressions and things like that that honestly don't move the story along that well. Um, I played probably a disc worth of this game, but I don't see myself going back to it to finish the other two discs. It's just honestly too corny to get through. But uh, this one is very difficult to find. Um, I bought this one maybe four or five years ago, and I had a really hard time finding it then. And I know even now it's especially dried up. Um, Capcom would probably like you to forget about this game. <laughs> I think it was U.S. developed and, um, you know, they were probably trying to bank on, like, the FMV craze and thinking it was going to continue after the Sega CD era, and then ultimately it kind of just died out right around 96, 97. So 
This one, uh, if you're curious, it's worth uh, worth trying just to see how weird it is. But it is nothing like anything else you'll see in this video. Is one thing I can tell you. Uh, another game that was kind of a surprise from Capcom is they got into snowboarding games. <laughs> so this is the first one of these, uh, but you're going to see another one in the video. This is Freestyle Borden 99, and uh, this one doesn't really have a great reputation. Um, this one I think they might have developed in-house, or maybe they farmed it out to some smaller developer. The other one, though, I think is a little bit more interesting, so we'll talk a little bit more when we get to that one. Um, I'm not a huge fan of the uh, snowboarding genre, I guess, of games. I don't think that any of them really caught my attention. Obviously, Cool Borders was the, the big series on the PS1, so then when games like this came out, everyone just thought they were trying to copy the formula of Cool Borders. So, overall, I don't think that one's going to be too much of a classic. Uh, this next one is another one of the fighting games that came out after the uh, Fighter's Edge series, so this is one of the later releases. This is JoJo's Bizarre Adventure. This also came out on the Dreamcast, which I have that version as well. Um, for some reason, this PS1 version is incredibly hard to find. I don't really know why, other than, again, the PS1 was getting a little bit late, long in the tooth by this point. But the Dreamcast version actually seems to be quite a bit easier to find than the PS1. Um, I got this game at the Portland Retro Gaming Expo like three or four years ago. And even at the time, I had a hard time finding it. And if you look this game up now, it's like going for cuckoo <laughs> dollars. But I kind of understand why, just because it's very difficult to find. Um, this one does have, I just wanted to point this out, it is not part of the Fighter's Edge series, but after the Fighter's Edge series, they kind of continued it on with the Capcom Edge series, which um, they're not like branded on the spine or on the front of the game, but you do still get the points and you could use it for the same type of merchandise. So they kind of tried to continue that. Some of the Dreamcast games have the Capcom Edge points too, um, but overall they did away with the uh, the branding on the cover and all that. So um very, you know, wacky fighting game. This one kind of stands alone as far as its style. It's obviously based on a, uh, a long-time Japanese series, so I'm sure that's uh, where a lot of the quirkiness comes from. Um, overall, you know, I would probably rather play this on the Dreamcast, though, so <laughs> I don't really think that, unless you just have to collect it, I don't really think there's a big reason to own this on the PS1, uh, but it is definitely a very difficult game to find. Uh, one that I bought initially new for the PS1 is the original Marvel Super Heroes. I thought this was such a cool game that came out at the time, having uh, some of the big heavy hitter Marvel characters from across several of the different titles, um, all in one fighting game. And I uh, really liked this game in the arcade. Uh, when it came out on the home version, I bought it right away. Um, I actually had it on the Saturn and the PS1. The Saturn version was a little bit better, so I sold my PS1 copy. Um, and then ultimately ended up buying this one back several years later. Uh, one thing I will tell you about this game, though, is there are a ton of variants of this game. <laughs> so I do not own all the variants on this. I don't know if I'm ever going to chase them all. But uh, there is one version of this that has, like, a completely clean black label cover. It doesn't have any of these, like, you know, bullseyes on it. Um, then there's this one that has the instant wind sweepstakes call out on the corner. And then there's another one that I used to have. It was the one I bought brand new, which was a Target exclusive. And it came with a free Capcom phone card inside that you could use to call their hints line. Um, it didn't have artwork from the game. It just had a generic Capcom uh, logo on it, but it was still kind of cool. And I'm really kicking myself for getting rid of that variant because you never seem to see that anymore. Or if you do, um, it's always missing the phone card. So very cool that uh, that exists. And then I'm going to show you another variant of this here in just one second. <laughs> so um, if you are, you know, a true variant hunter, that one will drive you crazy. Um, I don't feel the need to own them all, but this one I did need to own. This is the Fighter's Edge variant of it. So this one, um, you know, again, came out a few years later, has the, uh, you know, kind of clipped artwork on this one, which I don't really like as much. I think they kind of cut, you know, cut off half of Psylocke's eye, <laughs> which is not exactly the best, uh, best crop job. But um, anyways, this one exists. This one was not uh, a top tier Fighter's Edge title, so that why that reason you only got 15 points for this one. But um, it does exist in this variant, and I had to have it for that subset. Um, continuing the theme of the Marvel games, you also had Marvel Super Heroes vs. Street Fighter. This is where um, they really just were putting too much um, you know, into the PS1 that the memory couldn't handle. And this is another one of those games that is much better on the Saturn. So I have the Japanese Saturn version of this one, um, which I bought back in the day whenever it first came out. But uh, this one overall, I didn't like as much as just the standalone Marvel versus uh, Marvel Super Heroes or one of the other games we're going to talk about later. So for some reason, this one just didn't click as much. Um, the Japanese version also has a really quirky character added in that I think they removed from this U.S. version because it wouldn't really make sense for U.S. audiences. 
But um, anyways, it, it 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 you know it's one of the I guess lesser titles of this this overall series of versus games. Um, also, the Fighter's Edge version is the only version of this one, which is kind of weird, and the artwork on it is just so plain. It's just the logo. It's kind of weird that they didn't put any of the characters on there. So, I always thought that was kind of a, a strange one for the PS1. Uh, next is Marvel vs. Capcom. So this is another one of the ones that came out much later. Um, this one does not have the Fighter's Edge branding, and there is no Fighter's Edge variant of it. And uh, again, the Dreamcast is the way to play this game. Um, it's, you know, overall, I think, again, they learned a little bit from some of the issues they had with some of the Versus series games that came before it. So this one plays okay. Um, overall, the first Marvel vs. Capcom is not my favorite in the series anyway. And um, I just think, you know, if you're going to play this, you should play the sequel on the Dreamcast, or you should just play this one in general on the Dreamcast. So cool that they brought the two universes together. Um, you know, again, this was like the third or fourth Versus series title we got. So I think the novelty had started to wear off a little bit by this point, but um, still kind of cool that they brought this to the PS1. At least they made the effort, so... We'll talk about a little break from the fighting games for a moment, because uh, now we're going to move into another very popular Capcom series, and that is, of course, Mega Man. Um, Mega Man is very well represented on the PS1. Some of these got titles are unique to the system, which is cool, and then some of these are multi-platform games that got uh, released on the Saturn, or in compilations upon compilations years and years later. So you can take your pick as far as how to play a lot of these Mega Man games, uh, but this is one of the earlier ones. This is Mega Man 8. Um, this one is uh, part of the initial Mega Man series, and uh, ultimately that series had kind of lost its luster a little bit by this point. Um, this game looks okay. I mean, again, I think the Saturn is a slightly better way to play this game. But, um, you know, I think that most people were ready for something new with Mega Man after eight titles <laughs> of the uh, same general premise that we've seen back to the NES. So, um, nice that this came out. It's got the 10th anniversary branding on it. I think there might be a version of this that doesn't have that logo on it. I can't remember if that's true or not, but uh, I know there's a Greatest Hits version of this, too. I definitely don't go for the Greatest Hits variants, but just letting you know, there's some other versions of that out there. Um, let's talk about one of the unique Mega Man titles, though, that is a PS1 exclusive, as far as I know, is the Mega Man Legends series. Um, so this was the chance to really break off in a new direction. We are now in 3D, and this is the way forward for Mega Man. <laughs> well, it didn't really work out that way, because uh, they did make some other 3D Mega Man games, but it seems like the fans really wanted the series to stay 2D, so we did get a variety of 2D games that came um, for this on multiple, multiple platforms down the years. Um, I think Mega Man Legends is okay. Um, you do get some cool new characters in the series that we hadn't seen before. And um, I think, you know, a lot of love went into designing this game. Ultimately, the 3D mechanics of it are a little sloppy, and I think maybe that's what put people off. Plus, just the, you know, the culture shock of seeing Mega Man in 3D was really weird at the time. Um, I think people take that for granted because it's not so unusual today. But uh, at the time, you know, like, this was really weird to see this. And there was quite a backlash, I remember, when this game first, game first came out. Uh, but it was not enough to deter Capcom because they also released the sequel, <laughs> Mega Man Legends 2. Um, this one came out a couple years afterwards. Again, I don't think they sold nearly as many of this one, um, but you had, you know, a continuation of the series, some more development of the characters, and um, ultimately I didn't play this one nearly as much because it just kind of felt like more of the same, but I did, you know, get this pretty early on. I didn't, I don't think I bought this one new, but I, did, I was curious about it, so I did grab it pretty early. Um, and then if you are also a fan of the Mega Man X series, it is well represented on the PS1. So 1 through 3 came out on the Super Nintendo. Um, I was a huge fan of the first one on Super Nintendo. It was one of my first games I had as a kid. And um, really loved this series, you know, from that point. I kind of liked the darker, more serious tone of the Mega Man X series, even though they still are kind of cartoony. Um, but, you know, this one was pretty fun. I always liked Mega Man X4. Um, this one also came out on the Saturn, and uh, I think, you know, again, just plays a little bit better on that system, so I prefer it there, but this you can't go wrong in this game on PS1. Um, this one got multiple reissues and a greatest hits and all that kind of stuff, so you can get this game uh, really cheap compared to some of the other Mega Man titles. Uh, then we move into Mega Man X5. Um, this one was uh, exclusive for the PS1 at the time. Now, obviously, it's been included in a bunch of compilations and things like that. But, uh, you know, basically more of the same. Just a little bit more refined and uh, took advantage of the PS1 hardware, obviously, because it was its true intent when this game came out. And then if you liked that, there's more. <laughs> we get Mega Man X6. Um, or, obviously, the Rockman series in Japan. And uh, this one, you know, again, I think by this point... 
I was kind of just tired of it. Um, this one I did not buy new, and uh, I did buy this one, you know, pretty cheap when it, the price dropped, I remember. But uh, I didn't play this one nearly as much because I just think, you know, oh, six games in this series, eight games in the other series, it just was a lot uh, when you've been playing Mega Man for years, and it was really hard to keep up with the way that they were churning these out. But I know some diehard fans really do love every game in the series. Probably could tell you all the in intricate details of all the differences of these. I just haven't played some of these later titles as much as I did the early Mega Man games. And then we get to the uh, the crown jewel, I guess, of the <laughs> the Mega Man series, at least as far as value. All of a sudden, this game is like, I guess, the most expensive PS1 game in the U.S. that's uh, not a, a variant or anything like that, and that is The Misadventures of Tron Bon. Um, just a side quest game from the Mega Man Legends series. This one came out in between Legends 1 and Legends 2. So this one has um, a bonus demo disc for Legends 2 included. Um, again, it's got that funky dual tray thing that you, you know, flip the demo out, and it's still like a single thickness case, uh, but this one does have the demo disc. Um, Tron Bon, obviously, you know, if you like the Legend series, you probably will like this. Um, it's just a little bit more, you know, I guess, I don't know, like, just a very different theme to it overall, but it still is part of the Mega Man universe, probably the best way to explain it. Um, very wacky game overall. You got um, a lot of the uh, appearances by the serve, buttons, serve bots in this one, I remember as well. But, um, yeah, I don't really understand why this game has gone up so much. I, I think it is pretty difficult to find. I don't think this game sold that well. But I still think it's out there a lot more than some of the other really difficult-to-find PS1 games. So time will tell what happens with this one. But overall, this is a very difficult one to get for the PS1. Uh, next, we'll move on to a game I just bought recently, Unsealed. I owned a sealed copy of this for a long time. This is One Piece Mansion. Um, this one kind of stands alone on its own, too. It's uh, just this weird, like... I don't know, property management <laughs> type uh, simulator that you have to keep all these these tenants happy. Uh, very weird game, has this funky art style. I do think it's kind of cool. I, I want to put some more time into this one now that I have an open copy that I can play. Uh, but I did pop it in, and I do think that the artwork style really stands out. Um, this was also a later release Capcom series game, so I just don't think a whole lot of people played this. Um, the press at the time on it really wasn't all that good, so maybe that deterred some people too, but uh, it's neat that it exists. Uh, next is another one of the Fighter's Edge series games that only came out as a Fighter's Edge release. This is Pocket Fighter. Um, it is an SD version of all the Capcom fighters thrown into a, uh, you know, kind of cartoony style fighting game. Um, these SD character versions came out first in another title we're going to look at, but then they decided to go ahead and put them back into a fighting game from the other genre game that they appeared in. So kind of a weird gestation for this game. Um, I think it was worth, you know, just picking up and playing for a little bit. Uh, but ultimately, this one doesn't have the depth that some of the other Capcom fighting games have. Uh, I guess if you were just trying to get, like, a you know a young kid into the Capcom fighters, this might be a good place to start. So kind of neat that it exists. Uh, but this one only had, uh, I think I said that already, it only came in a Fighter's Edge version. So we've talked a little bit about um, the survival horror element with Dino Crisis. Let's talk about really where it all started with Capcom and survival horror. Uh, this is Resident Evil, the original one in the long box. And uh, this is a very well-known title that I don't need to go into a lot of detail on. But I do think it's cool that um, you know Capcom really built an empire off this one game. Um, you know, it has its fans and its detractors obviously the tank controls can be a little bit off-putting but i think for a very early ps1 game this uh you know if you consider what this was doing for the hardware at the time it was a very unique title and i, th I can definitely respect it for what it brought to the ps1 system um, then we go into variants, so I also have the jewel case variant of that original Resident Evil. I kind of prefer this just because, I don't. again, I don't like those ridge box style long boxes. Um, and this one's kind of cool that it comes in a nice clean jewel case. The artwork doesn't really suffer too bad on that one with it being shrunk down a little bit. Then we have, um, then they start milking it. <laughs> so then you get Resident Evil Director's Cut, and then this had a demo disc included for Resident Evil 2, so it came in a double disc case for this one, which is kind of weird compared to the other ones where they crammed it all in a single disc case. Um, this one, obviously, you know, more of the same, but um, had some, some enhancements to make the game better, and um, I do think it's nice that this, you know, existed in, in a kind of a funky double disc case. It makes it a little bit better on the shelf than those other ones where they crammed the demo inside it. 
And then of course we have a variant of that as well. So they did release a single jewel case version of this um, that does not have the demo disc and it has the artwork slightly altered on the cover um, just to make it fit on there a little bit better. Um, this one you don't see too often. It doesn't really seem to command a huge premium anymore. It's kind of gone up and down over time. But I would say if you do see this one out there, it's worth grabbing just because it's kind of, kind of an unusual variant um, in the market. Uh, then we get into a very popular sequel. This is Resident Evil 2. Um, this one's kind of notable for me because I turned in a bunch of my Fighter's Edge points and got this. <laughs> so this was a free game that Capcom sent me back in the day that was my uh, introduction to the Resident Evil series. I never played the first one when it came out, so this was the first one I started with. Um, definitely a uh, more polished game than the first one. has a cool storyline to it that's very well known, obviously. And uh, I think this one's pretty cool that it exists on the PS1. And then uh, recently I got the variant of that. So this is the uh, Resident Evil 2 DualShock uh, supported version. So um, kind of the Resident Evil 2 came out right around the time when Sony was releasing the DualShock. So it was notable that it did not support it initially. So then they went back and re-engineered the game so that it did take advantage of the uh, analog controls and the DualShock uh, feature. So kind of nice for those scary scenes when you got the controller rumbling. It was definitely a novelty at the time that we would take for granted now because just about every controller rumbles, <laughs> but uh, it was pretty neat at first when those DualShock games first started hitting the market. Uh, then we move into Resident Evil 3 Nemesis. Um, this one I got um, a fair while ago, but I just really haven't played it that much. I also have this one on the Dreamcast, so I don't know if I ever decide to get started on it. I'm not sure if I would start with the PS1 version that were originally released or if I just go straight to the Dreamcast version. But either way, you can get this game on uh, multiple consoles, including the GameCube, and uh, just kind of continues the Resident Evil classic series. But PS1, again, is where it got to start. Uh, this next one is one that, unfortunately, Capcom USA neutered. This is Resident Evil Survivor. Uh, this was initially uh, Biohazard Gun Survivor in Japan, and it was intended to be a light gun game that supported the Namco Gun Con. Um, but this was during the time when Columbine happened, and uh, Capcom was a little nervous about light gun games. Sega was as well, so I can't totally blame Capcom on that. And so ultimately they kept the gameplay, but they removed the light gun support for this U.S. version. So I do ultimately have the Japanese version of this now that I want to play just because I want to see like how the designers truly intended it. But I remember this game got really lousy reviews, but basically it was because the game wasn't intended to play with a DualShock controller. And, uh, you know, it's kind of tough playing a light gun game with a, um, a standard controller. So I think that's mainly why it got knocked. Maybe the storyline wasn't as in-depth as some of the other games, but I don't really think it was intended to be. It was really intended to be more of an arcade style game. So anyway, kind of a mixed bag on that one. Um, of all these games in this video, this is probably my all-time favorite. <laughs> this is Rival Schools. It is a uh, fantastic fighting game with a very unique set of characters that got its start here. And, well, it got its start in the arcade, and then the PS1 was the exclusive home version of this game. Um, this game is finally starting to get its due, I think, but I do think that um, you know this is how you do a 3D fighter right. Um, ultimately, the style of the game, the characters really lended well to that. And then they just jam this collection with a bunch of extras. It's actually a two-disc collection, which has um, a true arcade version of the game, as well as a lot of bonus features that are included in the second disc. So really nice collection, um, and I can give this my highest recommendation. I bought this game brand new and uh, played it an absolute ton when it first came out. Uh, I think it consumed a whole summer of my life was just playing Rival Schools with friends. I really liked this game, so... We will move on from there and talk about another fighter that is, um, I think this was the first of the 3D fighters that Capcom brought, if not the second. Uh, this is Star Gladiator, and it was called Episode 1, The Final Crusade, which kind of sounds uh, contradictory. But anyways, uh, this one was, I think, originally developed by a company called Arika in Japan. And, um, you know, I don't think this one went over so well. I think Capcom was testing the waters on how 3D fighters would do. Um, it just didn't have the polish. And then ultimately this game did get a Dreamcast sequel called Plasma Sword that also wasn't received very well. So since then, I think Capcom has killed off this series. You might see a couple of the characters in this appear in other Capcom fighters. But ultimately, this isn't the, the classic, um, you know, series that they were probably were hoping for when it launched. And then, of course, this one has a Fighter's Edge variant, also 
kind of surprised because this game didn't sell well in the first run, and then they did a reissue of it for the Fighter's Edge series. Um, this one is probably one of the more difficult to find Fighter's Edge series games, just because, again, I don't think they sold a lot of these. And it was um, only a 10-point game, which means it was one of the lower MSRP games when it first came out. All right, so we have talked a lot about fighting games in this video that Capcom brought to the PS1, but we still haven't even got to their most notable series. So this is really where Capcom's brand uh, took flight with the PS1. They really brought a lot of games in the series, and that is, of course, Street Fighter. So we're going to take a look at all the Street Fighter games for the PS1 next. First one of these is a long box release. This is the original Street Fighter Alpha. Um, this one's kind of weird because it doesn't come in a ridge style box like the other two. It just has this uh, flat paper style PS1 long box, which I also don't really like. My favorite of the three styles is the Saturn style cases, and unfortunately you can't get the Capcom games in that style of case. Um, but this one is, uh, well, th with the exception of the one that we're going to see next. So I guess really you got to see all three, <laughs> which is weird. Anyways, um, this one has kind of funky artwork. It's not the best in the Alpha series. Probably most people don't go back and play this one that much today. But um, it was considered an upgrade over the early Street Fighter games. So I think that's why um, you know they made the jump with this to the PS1. And then, of course, you could get that on the Saturn as well. Then we have the uh, pretty hard to find Fighter's Edge version of that same game. This one came out several years later. It was a low MSRP title. Um, and it has actually much improved artwork. They changed the artwork on it and the logo and, um, you know, brought it into this jewel case style. So I actually much prefer this um, over the long box. And you can take a look at the back there. And then much enhanced over that is Street Fighter Alpha 2. Um, I think this one is pretty well received. This game came out on a lot of different systems, including even the Super Nintendo, which is kind of weird because the first Alpha game did not. Um, so they, you know, wanted to have this game available as much as possible because I think this game was a bigger hit overall in the arcade. Um, but I definitely like Street Fighter Alpha 2. Um, I think that it's only eclipsed by one of the other games you're going to see in this video as far as all the Street Fighter games. Then, of course, we have a Fighter's Edge version of that game as well, <laughs> which uh, the artwork is cropped a little bit too much on that one. It doesn't really have the same effect, so I don't think this one's kind of poor looking. Uh, but this one is kind of difficult to find also. It's another one of those low point games, um, so I don't think they made a whole lot of this one. And then, much more notably, is Street Fighter Alpha 3. Um, this one is exclusive to the Fighter's Edge set on the PS1, so there is no other variants other than a Greatest Hits version, because this one actually sold really well. Um, I do think that this is a great collection. It's probably better on the Saturn overall in Japan, but uh, with the RAM cart. But overall, they did a nice job of bringing this to the PS1. I can see why this game sold so well. Um, it really had a, a great point system just to keep you, you know, earning up points to earn unlockables. There was a lot of mini games and things like that built into here. They really did a nice job of making a good uh, home version of this that kept you playing beyond just the initial fighting action. So I can highly recommend this one. You can also get this on the um, US Dreamcast, which is another alternative. And then I'm sure it's in a bunch of compilations and things like that now as well. Um, like I said, Capcom didn't make a ton of arcade compilations for the PS1, but this is one of those that they did. Um, this is Street Fighter Collection, and this came out um, also on the Saturn, but it came out with some uh, a collection of three of the earlier Street Fighter games. So you got Super Street Fighter 2, Street Fighter Alpha 2 Gold, and Super Street Fighter 2 Turbo. Um, obviously some very well-loved titles, and I think that this game was received pretty well for people that were big fans of the earlier ones but wanted a more enhanced version than what you could get on the 16-bit consoles at the time that most people were probably more accustomed to playing these games on. And then um, that one obviously did well enough that they reissued it for the Fighter's Edge series. Um, this is the uh, you know Fighter's Edge variant of that game. This one's a little bit more difficult to find as well. Um, it's kind of one of the weird ones that's a 15-point game. Usually the full Steam games were 20 points, the low ones were 10 points, and then you had a couple weird ones like this that were 15-point games. So kind of nice that this exists. And then this is also a two-disc game just like the other one was. Uh, and then, you know, again, kind of <laughs> straying from the theme, they brought back uh, Street Fighter Collection 2, but again, this one is only a Fighter's Edge version. There's no variants of this. So this one, you get uh, three more games in the series. You get Street Fighter 2 The World Warrior, so the initial Street Fighter 2. You get Street Fighter 2 Championship Edition, and then Street Fighter 2 Turbo Hyper Fighting. So what's kind of weird is I think the first game in the collection had some of the newer titles than this one does, but this one, I guess, for people that were... Really big fans of the earlier variants of those um, initial Street Fighter 2s. This, this is the person that this compilation would appeal to. Um, again, obviously you can get those games on other packs now, but at the time it was kind of cool that they brought these collections to the PS1. 
Um, and then of course we had to have a stab at bringing Street Fighter to 3D. <laughs> so uh, at the time Street Fighter was strictly a 2D franchise, always had been, and then this was the one that really rocked the world by um, bringing it into a 3D design. Uh, this one I think was also developed by Arika, um, and this is Street Fighter EX Plus Alpha. So this game, um, you know, outside of the initial shock that people had, I remember when this one came out as well, and the backlash that came with that, <laughs> the fighting action in this one really was kind of weak, even at the time, and I think that, um, you know, Namco had done a, a better job with bringing some of the games to a 3D design for fighting uh, games with the Tekken series, so this one didn't really stack up uh, with that. Um, this game was, I think, the initial appearance of Skullomania, which was a kind of a cool character, so at least you got that out of this, and then um, he was carried into other Street Fighter games later on from there. Um, then, of course, we have a Fighter's Edge variant of that one, another kind of weird one that, uh, you know, I'm surprised they brought a reissue of this, and it is one of those 15-point games. And then it did well enough that they did bring out a sequel. Um, this one is, uh, I believe, still exclusive to the PS1. I don't think this is on any other compilation. I might be wrong about that, but this is Street Fighter EX2+. Plus. So for some reason it loses the alpha in there. <laughs> but uh, this one does have a little bit more polish. I just think people were kind of over it by this point because uh, Street Fighter, for one, had started to kind of just run itself into the ground. And then also um, we had so much great Street Fighter Alpha games that there was no reason to rock the boat and play them in 3D. So um, I don't think this game really met their expectations either, but uh, it is kind of a unique one for the PS1 that, you know, you don't see you don't see this one too often. Uh, recently got this one. This is not one that is very exciting. This is Street Fighter the movie, the game. <laughs> and uh, this is a partnership between Capcom and Acclaim, so I guess you can blame either one of those two companies for this one. Uh, but this one obviously has the weird uh, digitized graphics with movie character art. And uh, it just feels very strange. It's, you know, more like a Mortal Kombat style game than a Street Fighter game, I guess. Um, obviously, the digitized character fad died out pretty soon after this, so that's why this game... Time hasn't been too kind to this game, let's just put it that way. Uh, then we get into another great compilation. So, like I said, they didn't do a whole lot of compilations, but they did this game, and I'm very happy that they did. This is Strider 2. Um, Strider 2 itself is a great exclusive for the PS1. Um, beautiful 2D art. The uh, the one rub on the game is it is pretty short, but it is an awesome looking game and very fun to play. Um, I always did like the Strider series, and I think this game really holds up well on the PS1. And then, um, as a nice bonus, you get the original Strider arcade game in this compilation as well. So that's why I say it's kind of a, a pack with two games. Uh, the weirdest thing about this is they did put those two games on two separate discs, which I'm not really sure why, because Strider 1 can't take up too much space. And then the strangest thing about it is the Strider 2 disc is the one that has the original Strider on it, and then the Strider disc is the one that has Strider 2 on it, if I remember right. Some, somehow there was a, an error at the factory, and they flipped <laughs> the content of both discs, and then they never corrected it. So as far as I know, they're all misprints like that. Um, but very happy this came out. This one is um, definitely gone up in price a lot, but I can see why. I just think it's a really cool, stylish game for the PS1 and kind of stands alone in uh, the rest of this library. There's not a whole lot of other games that I would liken to this style of game. Uh, next, we're going to talk about an incredibly addictive game. This is Super Puzzle Fighter 2 Turbo. Um, I have put countless hours <laughs> into this game. I probably have played it more on the Saturn than the PS1. This is one that, honestly, the graphics don't suffer on the PS1, so I can highly recommend getting this on either platform. Um, very, very fun take on the puzzle genre with uh, all the little SD you know, animated Capcom fighting game characters and Darkstalkers characters included. Um, really a fun game and uh, great two-player action. Um, I've had... People get into fights <laughs> in, on the couch, basically, over some of the things that have happened to this game over the years. But definitely can recommend it, and um, I put a lot of time into this game when it first came out. So I just think it's really cool that we got this, you know, kind of a, a different genre from Capcom, but they did such a nice job with it. I wish they would have made some, some sequels to this based on how successful this game probably was for them. Uh, so next, now we're back to the snowboarding genre. <laughs> like I said, we visited that earlier in the video. This is the one that's uh, a little bit more difficult to find. It came out later, and this is Trickin' Snowboarder. And why I wanted to talk about this one for at least a moment is this was actually developed by Cave. Yeah, the company that makes all the shooting games. <laughs> for some reason, they also like snowboarding games. They put out steep slope sliders on the Sega Saturn, and then they developed this game for Capcom. So if uh, you wanted something by, you know, a 
shooter maniac developer that also puts out snowboarding games, you can certainly get this. Um, this one I played a little bit more than the other one. I think it's okay. Um, overall, it's just, you know, again, not really my genre. But uh, I do think it's kind of weird, uh, weird that uh, Capcom put out this, this uh, you know, series on the system. <laughs> Uh, next we have uh, X-Men vs. Street Fighter, which is one of my all-time favorite Capcom vs. series games. But I like to play this game on the Saturn. <laughs> Unfortunately, the PS1 version is not the best and uh, obviously didn't have the RAM cart that the Saturn had that gave it the huge advantage. Plus, Capcom probably really hadn't figured out how to make versus games work on the PS1. So ultimately, the, uh, the true tag player action doesn't even work on this game correctly. And that's why in Japan they call this like X-Men vs. Street Fighter EX, uh, which is basically means it's the gimped version. It doesn't have the same features as the Saturn version. So um, while I really like the series, I like the franchise, I just think that this is not the best way to play this game. Um, it still does, you know, it's a very high demand game and it only comes in this Fighter's Edge version. Um, but I just really think that, you know, for what people pay for this game, you should almost just get a Saturn and get the Japanese version of the other one because it's, it's truly that much better on that system. And then uh, finally, but, uh, you know, another very strange one, we have X-Men Children of the Atom. So this was the initial um, basis for kind of the Capcom versus fighters before it even became the versus series. And this one is all just X-Men characters. So it's not even other Marvel characters. It's just exclusively X-Men characters. Why this game is incredibly weird for the PS1 is that this game came out on the Saturn, I believe, in 95 or 96. So it was a very early Saturn title. And then for some reason, the PS1, we didn't get this game until 1998. Um, so what's strange is that there were many, many later Versus series games that were out on the market. There were other more refined Capcom fighters. And here we are getting this game that's three years old by this point. Um, so I really don't know why this game came out like it did. And then if you notice, this has the branding of Capcom and Acclaim again. So it may have been driven by Acclaim more so than Capcom as far as why this game got released when it did. Um, but this one is definitely a weird curiosity of the PS1, because I think, you know, most people already own this game on the Saturn if they were interested by this point. Uh, but that is, um, you know, the conclusion of this this sub this series of Capcom games. Um, kind of a weird one to end on, but overall it is, uh, you know, one of the, the more unique titles of this library. So hopefully I didn't talk too much. I tried to keep it as brief as I could. I did have a lot of passion around some of the games that you saw in this video. Um, many of these games I've owned since brand new because I just think Capcom is a very cool developer for the system and one of the key reasons of why the PS1 was so successful. I uh, really want to thank you for taking the time to watch. Please take a moment, like, comment, subscribe, let me know what you think, and I will talk to you soon. Have a great day or night, wherever you are.